Hey, everybody. Welcome to another edition of The Collective Podcast. And every week, we like to dig in with entrepreneurs, solopreneurs, business owners, influencers, people in real estate lending, car sales, solar, media, uh, from across the spectrums, because there are so many things that are the same, and there are things that are different, and that can make us all better. Today, we've got a special guest. No normally, we bring on people that are just experts in a craft, but this guy is also a personal friend of mine. And uh, his story from kind of traditional sales, moving into something that he's, it's a passion project that's also been very successful. It's really cool. Jeremy with an A, Jeremy Poole. For those of you who look him up, Jeremy, J-E-R-A-M-Y, not J-E-R-E-M-Y, like my brother. Who <laughs> I, I spelled this guy's name wrong for the first two years of our friendship. And so, <laughs> Jeremy, my man, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, brother. I'm honored, man. Um, everything that we've always done together always turned out great. So I'm super excited to be here. Awesome. Well, um, we won't talk about the technical glitches because that that was before yeah. we put on the makeup. So like that, that was, doesn't count, right? Yeah, no, no, that's the past. Yeah, <laughs> that's the past. Listen, I would love it if you'd share your story and and kind of start with because you and I were in the same industry, traditional mortgage. Yeah. We both right. leveraged that traditional sales job into many other things, and I think it's so fitting for kind of closing out a series that we've been doing on niche marketing, which is not only product-based, but also audience-based. And I'd love to kind of have you share your story with our audience. Okay, cool. Well, I think the best way to do that is to kind of give you a backstory of the backstory, just so people have a better understanding of, of how I fell into this. Because I, I really did just, just, just fall into it. Um, so I was running a investment fund in Kirkland, Washington. We were developing an algorithm to better assess human longevity. And that turned into an application that got the attention of companies like LinkedIn, um, in which we did a beta test on this really cool system called OptiLife that we developed, which I was a CFO and president of, and they were interested in buying it. Well, we wanted to not only look at doing a big deal with LinkedIn. We also wanted to offer it to companies like Google, Facebook, and other large insurance companies that could benefit from a better understanding of human longevity to better assess life insurance policies and just overall longevity to increase human, um, essentially to optimize a human in a workplace. Sounds complicated, but it's actually rather simple if you understand the science behind it. But I had this brilliant idea at church that I wanted to take the really cool videos I was watching that my church was 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 using, the Rock Church in San Diego, to raise funds for different charities and, and programs. And I thought to myself, we should have a really cool promo video uh, to promote this product. And that whole process was just so fun to me. So we spent a few months um, casting in LA, having actors and actresses and the music and scenes. And I just really fell in love with that whole process. And everybody was really um, excited about what I created. And ultimately, we, we did a fairly large beta test on social media by promoting this video and then creating ads using video. And I've never had any experience with video before. And so I saw the experience from that. Long story short, I wound up selling that company, moving back to Washington, my hometown, to get back into mortgage lending, which is something I really didn't want to do. But I was friends with a, a few of the top agents in my market. And they just said, hey, look, if you reactivate your license as a mortgage lender, I will give you all my business. So I said, great. Worst case scenario, I'll make a few hundred grand. So I do just that. But I found myself now wearing a suit in an office in which for the last four years, I've been wearing flip flop shorts and tank top and working on the beach. And I just realized that lifestyle wasn't for me. So if I was going to do this mortgage lending thing, I had to do it my way. And and for everything that really has worked for me, I had to do it over the top. I had to go the extra mile. I had to make a splash. So I thought to myself, well, the number one lender in Pierce County, which is the market I was in, was hosting these monthly events for his realtor partners. And typically it was stale beer, free pizza at a very lame venue. And um, I thought to myself, well, if he's attracting 10 to 14 people per month, he's not charging anything for this. It's not sexy. It's not cool. It's not interesting. It's really just a marketing pitch. And out of respect, I felt like they were showing up. So outside of just networking and free beer and, and, and pizza, there was really no draw. So I thought to myself, what if, what if there was a organization that wasn't tied to any particular company? 
uh, preferably a nonprofit that hosted super sexy high-end events at the best venues, strict dress code, um, high-end raffle items. What if th there was something like this that existed, that attracted all the people that I wanted to network with and do business with? So here I am at this sexy party and everywhere I turn, there are people that I want to do business with. So I wound up creating this uh, nonprofit called the PNW Real Estate Social Club. And the sole purpose of this was to raise money from large companies, companies like my mortgage bank that I worked for, brokerages, title companies, insurance companies, billion dollar companies. And what's funny about this is that every single company I proposed a sponsorship to said yes. And, and a big part of that is I don't think it was necessarily me or the idea. I think it was the energy. I was able to cast such a big vision for myself for how I could do this thing called being a mortgage lender in a way that I thought was sustainable, something that, that matched my personality, my ambition, and it just worked. So here I am talking to people. I have no experience hosting events, but I'm casting this huge vision. And I think people were willing to, to take a chance on me. So long story short, uh, the first event I did was um, at the Social Bar and Grill, uh, right next to the Glass Museum. Uh, in, in the back, there was yachts. It was on the water. I, I was willing to negotiate with the owner of that restaurant and bar to take over the entire place and basically just turn it into the coolest club ever. Outside DJ, strict dress uh, code. Um, all the ladies had to show up in high heels, dress. Men had to show up in suits or, or, or at least a sport coat. And it was awesome. Um, very few people in the market knew me. I think at, at that point in time, I just got, I just reactivated my license like two months prior. <laughs> I had maybe one deal in my pipeline. <laughs> and so people were like, you know, they're showing up. Um, by the way, 95 people showed up. Most of the people who came were from Bellevue and Seattle, purely just because of how I marketed it. And so my perspective from hosting these types of events was always first and foremost, it's going to be a blast. First and foremost, it's a party. Second of all, you might meet some great people. And third of all, you might learn something. Now, if you look at how other companies market their networking events or their events, it's backwards. Usually it's you're going to learn some stuff. You're going to network. And they usually just leave out the fun part, which is why people get dressed up and want to come out. And every single event I did was just a smash success that 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 first event um we got five deals from five applications immediately from the people who came all of them closed and then i took a big bold move and i reinvested the thirty-seven thousand i made from that and i rented out the largest most expensive venue in pierce county which is the shahuli glass museum um that event cost me around seventy eight thousand dollars to host uh, if I had any idea it was going to cost that much, I probably wouldn't have done it. But I brought in uh, more than that. And in fact, the nonprofit was able to profit about $22,000, which is not only did we sell 640 tickets, 640 tickets. at What was your price point on your ticket? Okay, 100 bucks a ticket? Yep, yep. So okay. $100 a ticket. Um, we were only supposed to have 400 people in the venue, but <laughs> they allowed us to have 474. And so I, I had a refund, um, you know, quite a few people. That's a, that's a good problem to have. G yes. So we had red carpets and we had sports cars outside the door. And so there is another 150 people lined up all dressed up on New Year's, by the way, ready to, 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 to come in. So it was a great look. And all of our sponsors were very, very happy. Um, so I dissected that. I started looking at it like, I'm not well known, so so they weren't coming for Jeremy Poole. Uh, the mortgage bank was doing about twelve billion dollars a year, so not not huge. And we had very little footprint in the market I was in. Their main footprint was like like on the East Coast or California. And so I looked at it and said, why were people willing to come out, take a chance, spend their New Year's um, for something that was pretty clear that it was real estate networking focus? And a lot of people that showed up weren't in real estate, but uh, but most of them were business owners or entrepreneurs. And I realized that I created the type of party that I would want to go to. And I think this is the core of my message. And I think if there's one thing I can give you on this on this podcast for your audiences, I think a big mistake that a lot of people make is that they try to look at their audience and says, what do they want? 
how can I get them here? And what I found is that I work with, you know, guys like you, very successful. I work with doctors. I work with attorneys. I work with people who are just starting out. I, I, I just so happen to work with the number one agent in our state. Um, is that we're all pretty alike. It doesn't matter if you're white, black, tall, short, old, young. We all kind of like the same stuff on a spectrum. And so I found that if I take the perspective of dissecting me, because I know me better than anybody else, and figure out what would what would get Jeremy excited, what kind of verb, what type of energy, what kind of visuals, what kind of music would get me to come. So if I like it first and foremost, and I'm excited, now I put myself in the best possible position to articulate, communicate, and promote in a way that my energy is 100% transferable. So as I'm talking to people, they're going to mimic that energy as they're talking to somebody else and say, hey, I'm thinking about going to this really cool New Year's Eve party. Some guy named Jeremy Poole's hosting it. You want to come. Um, and I found that to be incredibly effective. And in fact, I've been able to since then consult with some of the largest companies in real estate, both on the broker side and on the lending side around events in terms of, you know, they would come to me and say, Jeremy, you've hosted some of the biggest events in our market and it's just you and your budget is nowhere near ours. How come your events are so successful and ours aren't? And I explained to them is that you're taking, you're taking the wrong perspective uh, approach to marketing. People always want to have a good time. People always want um, to work hard and play hard. And if you give them that, if you give them a reason to get dressed up, if you give them a reason to be excited about something and you're going to get something for your business, thus networking and learning something. But first and foremost, it needs to be heavy on the party fun side, especially if you're charging. I have found that to be incredibly successful um, because, you know, you and I both know we've seen so many companies who have buku bucks who have hosted things where it's just primarily around education and they suck. <laughs> they fail because there's nothing there's nothing there for the human spirit to get super excited about. I want to dissect a bunch of things you said. And I have a I have the benefit of seeing the other side of like putting on events with you and what works and what doesn't. And like if we and not every event is a smashing success. And so you sure. learn from those things. And so I think that. What I, I find is sometimes the things that don't work are as impactful as the things that do when you're teaching other people. So I want to kind of right. take a couple different tracks here. First, your events became the thing that you were known for. Let's call that your product and lending. You didn't okay. say I'm the DPA guy. I'm the jumbo lender. I'm the no. work the weekend lender. I'm the call you back within 10 minutes lender. You were the, you're the, I like to party in the most sophisticated, fun, like way where when people see that, they want to be a part of it. And oh, by the way, yeah. I do most of the loans that you're probably going to need. And, sure. right. and, and, and then I think you also kind of pivoted even into being the connector of connectors. Yeah. And so like you got, you got revenue kind of by default. It's like, well, I'm going to give Jeremy my loan almost as like a currency for making introductions in some ways. Well, that, but, um, what I was trying to set out to do is that coming back into the market of being a mortgage lender, I haven't done a loan in seven years. So I'm competing with a lot of lenders that, like yourself who are incredibly seasoned, who are way better than me. I mean, just quite frankly, they're way better than me because they're way more experienced. They have better turn times, probably better rates because uh, they're getting special treatment from their branch manager or what have you. So on every front of being a new lender, I was inferior. And so I quickly identified that I can't win on that front. But uh, if you put me in front of someone, they're usually going to want to do something with me. And so how do I put myself around more people that I want to do business with? And I found that events and video marketing was the best way to do that. What, what a lot of big agents were saying to me initially, and here's something else that was really interesting on the post event was a lot of the top agents I was planning to reach out to came to my event reached out to me first and their interest wasn't around me being a lender. Their interest was, wow, how did you pull that off? I'm interested in you as a friend. So then and now my approach to marketing is really relationship marketing, personality based marketing, rather than trying to identify again, what you think your audience wants. Think about what you want. Think about what makes you unique and special and present that to the world and with your own flavor. 
And I think the reason why a lot of agents were giving me a shot was, A, I like you. B, um, I realize that you're not as experienced as my current lender. But if you can organize something like that, you most certainly have the cognitive ability to close a loan. And that is what most agents said, because I, I asked them, like, why are you willing to take a risk and jeopardize your relationship with such a prominent, well-known lender? And they said, you know, quite frankly, I like you more. I like you more. When you call me, I smile. And I think that's super important to remember. It's not just about how good you are at your job. How good are you at cultivating and 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 just fostering high quality relationships with all my clients? I try to get into friend zone because you're always going to have difficulties. You're always going to have issues. And if you can handle that from a friend's perspective to where you always have their best interest at hand, despite not being the best, you're going to put yourself in a really good position to win. Well, I think also uh, it, the relationship piece is huge. Also, psychologically, like we all know that if we were waiting in line to get into an event, sports event, concert, club, whatever, and somebody walks up to the bouncer, like high five, chest bumps it up, the guy moves the velvet rope and they walk in, yeah. you, in you instantly want to be friends with that person. Totally. You, you, you're like, what does that guy or gal have that I don't, that I want? Who are they? They must be interesting, right, right? right? And so you create this mystique, persona, brand, even just around the, being the connector of connectors, being the networker of networkers. And, and, and what's crazy is you literally created the velvet rope. You hired the bouncer, you created the door for the club, you created yeah. the line, and then you walked up through the line you created, opened the velvet <laughs> rope, yeah. you bought, yeah. walked in and they yeah. go, I want to know this guy. And, right. and that's sci the psychology of marketing is so important. Also, I think as you were talking, I started thinking of this philosophy. Profit comes a lot of times from proximity. Yes, yes, absolutely. Right? The, the closer you're in proximity to people, like that are doing the things, buying the products, investing in the things that benefit you, the yeah. more you benefit, right? Through proximity. Yes. yes. And, and so it kind of goes back to like, they just liked you more. That was because of proximity. And I think that's important. And, and so proximity, and now that you're in a place of power, meaning you have their attention, this is, this is so important. You, you, you have to be willing to take risk, let your hair down and be your genuine self. When you're around people who have the ability to have a, a significant financial impact on your life in a positive way, if you're willing to take risk, not try to be prestigious, not try to be overly professional, not try to use words that you typically don't use, not try to um, kiss anyone's butt, just be 100% yourself. That is so unique and so special because most people change when they're around different environments. And so if you find yourself in close proximity to, to powerful people and you approach those conversations humbly, even though that you did something spectacular, like throw a 600 person party and it sold out, talk to people as if you're just a nobody. Yeah, that I, have, I, have, I have found to be incredibly powerful because people are expecting you to act arrogant. And if you do something really special and you don't act arrogant and you act very humble, it gets people interested and in like, you're not even impressed with what you did. Interesting. Interesting. And so yeah, well, it's, it's the guy walking up to the velvet rope who stops to like say hi to everyone in line. Yeah. Right. And, and, and say, sorry, Hey guys, you know, I, you know, <laughs> like, you know, I, like I buy these guys a lot of, you know, yeah, I buy yeah. these guys, a lot of coffees. They like me, you know, like it's that yeah. humility piece. So it's, yeah, it's building a persona. It's executing on the event, which I want to touch on because that is so important. And you and I know what, what we know when somebody's not going to execute on an event 30 100%. days before the event. So, and, and I think it's that proximity piece. It's also and the humility piece is huge. And there's so few people that are really successful. There are more than you would know, but there are very few people that are really, really humble. Yeah, right. And from a place of humility. Yeah. And so it's like so refreshing when you see that. Okay. Let's break down for just a couple minutes. Like the 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 do's and don'ts of putting on an impactful event. Great, perfect, awesome. I love that. Um, and let, let's kind of break down to like where where do you even start? Like yeah, location spots and things like that. Hundred percent. Okay. So the first place I start first and foremost is I don't even go into all the things I have to do first. I look at 
okay, if the event is 90 days out and the event is a smash success, what does it look like? What's the venue? I even go to the venue before I even have it secured. I walk the property. I visualize the line outside. Like I spend a lot of time in my mind thinking about what does this thing look like? Okay. And then from there, I break down week by week what would need to happen in order for me to hit this target. So if I want to sell 500 tickets and we are 90 days out, I need to start marketing at this date. I need to have X amount of tickets sold by this date. I need to have X amount of videos going at this date. I need X amount of sponsors by, by this date. Because a lot of time people have a vision, usually it's pretty half-assed, and they don't have a clear plan day by day what needs to get done. Um, and if you chunk it down by weeks and then you chunk weeks down by days and you execute, it's all about execution. And my thought process around hosting events has always been uh, kill ants with sledgehammers. If we need a hundred flyers, let's do a thousand. If two videos will do it, let's do 30. Because usually there's a very thin line between your event was eh to your event was a smash success. And ultimately you need to get people who are in a certain market or in a certain industry, in a certain group, all nodding their heads saying, yes, I'm going. Because if too many people in their circle of influence say, you know, I don't think I'm going to go, that's going to taint their motivation to attend your event. And so I've always believed in you have to go way over the top. And I also believe that if you're going to do an event for the sake of building your business, you might as well not even do it if you're not going to stretch yourself. Because if you're willing to stretch yourself, what you do is you put yourself to where your back is against the wall, and now you have to come out swinging. Because if 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 you have the perception that throwing a, a event that's worth throwing is going to be easy, you've already felt. I go into each big event with this mindset is that this has to be a smash success. And therefore, you have a sense of urgency, and every conversation is very important. And you and I both have seen, with a ton of agents especially, um, they want to do events. There's a ton of benefit to, to doing events, but they're lackadaisical. And it, 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 it's almost as if they have reached some conclusion that they have some phantom assistants who are doing things on the <laughs> sideline for well, them, but no one's doing anything. This is like, so the, the thing that we, we I, I'm going to keep running with this analogy of the guy walking to the front of the line. What people yeah. see is the guy walking to the front of the line. What they don't see is that 30 minutes before that, you were scrambling behind stage to get the you know, to get the champagne chilled yes. and, and you, and the, and the vendor for your hors d'oeuvres was lay and like all you are all, you're wearing all of the hats. And so all the hats. unless you can afford to wear none of the hats, you're wearing all of the hats mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you've got to be, before you even get started, are you willing to like set up speakers and create Canva graphics for your visuals and record and follow up with the marketing campaign. And if you're not, and we see this, it fails because then they lean on us to do all the execution. And that the party is not even no. the end game. Good point. Great, great. I'm so happy you said that because um, I want the result. I like going to networking events. I don't go to enough of them, um, but I'm not necessarily there. For the event i'm not hosting the event for the event i'm hosting the event for all the marketing i'm going to go that's that's going to happen and all the conversations that are going to happen post the event and a lot of people miss that yeah so 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 this is something that i want to like repeat this in a different way people think that if you're doing an event in 30 days that that event on day 30 is the actual product when the reality yeah. is or the goal your goal, your product is the pre-event marketing ramp yes. up yes. and the post-event proximity, relationship building, yes. influence creation. Like, And so what's so interesting is they're like, it's all about the event. The event was a smashing success. And then they don't follow up with anyone and they have no well, proximity for profit or, or, or they, they go, I just got to get the hors d'oeuvres for the event, but then they don't yeah. do 30 days of content creation yeah. right. and well, engagement. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 so important because post event, excuse me, pre event, post event, what happened? Did you have like were you promoted? Did, did you move locations? Uh, do you have a new loan product? Nothing changed. All that changed is now you created some opportunity. And by opportunity, what I mean was because I was new in the market, I love the idea of hosting a large enough event that sponsors, big sponsors like Tiger Title, Acura. Um, um, 
large insurance companies would be interested in hosting the event so I can open some doors. And if you host a large enough event in which you got billion dollar companies sponsoring your events, that's going to attract a lot of attention. So all I was trying to do was attract a ton of attention and then get enough high quality people that I wanted to work with say, so how are you affording this? Like, what do you do for a living? And here's something else that I have found to be incredibly important when you're hosting events. Don't make it so obvious that it's a marketing scheme for you. Try to detach yourself from the event enough to where people just see it as that's just your lifestyle. That's just how you do things. And oh, by the way, I just so happen to be an incredible lender. I, I have found that to be incredibly impactful. Yeah, it's almost like you want people to have to say to you, you're Jeremy Poole. Dude, I saw you online, man. Like, I didn't know you knew so-and-so. Yeah. And what an incredible event. What do you do for a living? <laughs> like, mm -hmm. that's old. And then you go, oh, well, dude, we should grab a drink next week. And like, yes. let's grab yes. coffee and like, I'll walk. Yes. I'm actually, I own a financial advising firm or I own a construction company or I'm in litigation law or whatever. And they go, oh my gosh, I happen to have a need for I need that. Yeah. Because, because first and foremost, I like you. I like I'm you. I'm interested in you. And I like and you do what you're with. Yeah. And people who like people, we naturally want to help people. Like we are naturally altruistic in that way. And so if I'm interested in you and I feel like we have a thing going, I'm like, oh, like, what do you do? Oh, dude, I think I have someone for you. That's going to happen naturally. And so if you approach it from the standpoint of hands are open, give me, give me, give me, I'm doing this because I want loans. Where are my loans? Yeah. You're not going to have success doing that versus give first, give a great yeah. experience, have a great time, give friendship first. And out of the law of reciprocity, people would naturally want to help you. So I found that to be incredibly impactful. It, it wasn't so much the people that could immediately give me a loan that were interested in working with me. It was the people who were more successful than me, who had more to offer me than I had to offer them, who were impressed with what just happened. They said, you know what? I like you. I'm going to help you out. Yeah. If your cologne is called desperation, no one's yeah. going to like that smell. But no. when your cologne is abundance, everybody wants to be around that person. Okay. We're running out of time. Mm -hmm. Just a couple of kind of um, tactical items. So you're, you're doing an event for a hundred people mm -hmm. and you, 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 you know, you need at least, let's just say 45 days or more to plan this. How mm -hmm. many times are you engaging like, just give me a quick brass tax. How many pieces of content are you creating? And and, and I want to just pause and preface all of this. What Jeremy mentioned about bringing in sponsors and other people, one of the keys to marketing is through other people's influence. Yeah. So when, when you bring on a sponsor and they go, I'm going to this event, they're not just saying that to your people. They're saying that to their people. And Correct. then another person and if 50 people know 50 people and you start to do the math. 2,500 people are hearing about an event that you have a hundred everyone's talking about it. Right. So let's talk about that. Also, one thing I want to point out is that Jeremy charges for his events. Always. These aren't free with a Costco platter of croissant witches <laughs> where you're going to get one hour of CE. There are Lamborghinis parked in front of a glass museum with a hundred dollar ticket. And all you're going to get is access to buy drinks or something like that. So, yeah. Right. So these, these, these are not free events. These are paid events. That's a tactical piece that we pivoted on and found great success. Yeah. On the content piece, how many times are you engaging? And what's your, like, if you just had a minute to kind of walk people through, this is what you should do to get people interested. What would you do? Yeah. Great question. I don't think I have a specific number of pieces of content, but I think the best way to approach it is, is see the event as a catalyst for a massive marketing pain. Uh, campaign in which it gives you permission to promote relentlessly. And so the reason for the sponsors, yes, was to help with the deposit and the cost of the catering and the cost of the venue. Yeah, that's great. But that's not why I wanted sponsors. I wanted to tie a billion dollar name to little old Jeremy who had five loans in his pipeline. So more affluent, interesting people that I was interested in would be interested in me. Now, with a marketing campaign, don't see it as like, event January 5th over and over and over again. You're not Coca-Cola, you're not Pepsi. That's a bad idea. What you wanna do is build momentum. So first and foremost, I'm thinking about hosting a party. Would you be interested? You'd be surprised how many people say yes. Second of all, I'm doing it at this venue. 
here it is. It's super cool. I'm really excited about it. Talk about the square footage, talk about the ease of parking, talk about all the benefits. Then every milestone should build on top of each other so people have a sense of this is going to be a successful event. And if you break down any event, the number one thing that's happening in the background of, of everyone's mind is, is it worth my time? And a big question to that is, are people going to show up? Now, if people have a sense that the that a good portion of their friends, a good portion of the industry, a good portion of the people that I want to be rubbing shoulder with, with are going to be there. It doesn't matter what you're charging. For instance, I hosted I hosted a event for my podcast at a theater in which I was charging between two hundred and fifty and a thousand dollars per seat. I was I literally just started the podcast. Everyone told me it would be a failure, but it was a, a success. A huge success, primarily, in my opinion, because of the venue and because of how it was marketed. But then thirdly, because of the price point. Price point said, come dress to impress. Price point said, this is best. This is for the best of the best. And if you're not the best of the best, and if you can't afford a $250 ticket to be around the best of the best, then it's not for you. You'd be surprised how well that works because it's so different from what everybody else does. What everybody else is coming from a... a a, a lack perspective of, well, my event has to be free because nobody's going to I can't come. get people to show up if it's not free. Yeah. Right. And they're so stuck on that this is a marketing campaign for yourself, which it is. But you have to trick yourself into try to add so much value to where it's, it's no longer about you. Yes, you're going to benefit from it, but try to get yourself away from that. And try to try to try to approach it from an abundant standpoint of how how can I make this event an absolute no brainer for anybody, regardless of what we're charging, they're going to want to be there because you're going to get way more than what you paid. Well, bro, thank you for just all this insight. You went from like dabbling in media with for a church event to being a lender like me, slaying and loans seven days a week, you know, on the grind, you, not you loving know, it. not loving it <laughs> to now you know, CEO and founder of Pool Media, working with not only real estate lending, but I love seeing your content for other industries, yeah, the construction, the attorneys, because at the end of the day, the collective is about enhancing entrepreneurship and yeah. being an entrepreneur is not being a slave to one thing in one season at one time in one place. It's, right. it's having that mindset of what's next, what's more, how do I make what I did even better, more fun, you know, really touch on my passions? And you've done that and you continue to evolve. And I love that, man. I love that about you. Um, you. We also share a passion for overpriced clothing. I don't get to do that <laughs> as much, you know, like in, in our industry right now. Yeah. It's, about, it's about buying Costco. But I love it, man. Thank you for your heart. Thank you for your time. If people want to reach out to you because you are a media company that is a you're a you're a brand focused connector of people and you do that through several mediums, how do they reach out to you? Yeah, I, I think the easiest way is just to find me on Facebook uh, on my personal account. That's just Jeremy Poole on Facebook. You can DM me. Um, I believe my cell phone number is on there as well. So if you are interested in marketing, if you're interested in consulting, I also do a lot of uh, speech coaching through an entity called Club Content. And I work with a wide variety of people because everybody wants to do video content. The yeah. biggest part, the biggest hurdle is simply this. I don't want to look dumb and sound dumb. And so what I specialize in is I help you become more of you on camera. And that's it. It's like, if you're successful at what you do, you're probably really good in person. But for some reason, once you get on camera, you feel like you have to be somebody else. And the secret sauce is being more of you on camera. And when you do that, now you stand out. So Love it, bro. Thank you. Guys, as always, um, thank you for joining another edition of the Collective Podcast. Leave us feedback. Leave us a five-star review on whatever platform you're listening to this. I think we have over 400 episodes of our podcast wow. and Perfect. we love the feedback It's and we're going to bring Jeremy back because it's funny. What we talked about today is not even really what you're currently focusing your best of time on. No, and no, no. At the very end club content and these other things you're doing with coaching around speech, around presentation, around video and HubSpot did a, a annual report and talked about the top three forms of marketing and spoiler alert, it's not print, it's not radio, it's not TV. It's primarily all somehow connected to social media and content creation. And Absolutely. so it's so important. So thank you, my man. Thank you as thank always, you. guys. We'll see you on the next episode. Honor. Thank you, brother. I'll talk to you.